In the shadow of past global conflicts, today's leader is a challenge to shift from crisis management to mastering the art of victory. Our adversaries seek to exploit vulnerabilities. To counteract, we're identifying threats, enhancing our military capabilities, and embedding a winning philosophy across our strategic plans. Step into the arena of strategy of winning. Here, the past and future converge, crafting blueprints for victory and peace. Join us, because to secure tomorrow, we must define our path to victory today. So welcome to... <laughs> Try again. Um, yeah, welcome to the opening panel of this uh, great conference that promises to be very uh, interesting and uh, provide us with a lot of food for thought. And I have the great honor and pleasure to moderate uh, these amazing speakers here um, when we are trying to get into the, the question, how can we define winning and victory? And is winning actually more an art of, or a craft? So if we take a look back and we think about like how we in the West um, have been successful in the past. So NATO was quite successful with this uh, strategy of winning the war without fighting it in the Cold War, um, at least as a hot war at that time. But um, after that, we were sort of able to pick and choose where and when to go to war most of the time. Uh, maybe not always the timing, but it was certainly there was there was a physical distance uh, to the war most of the time. But now in Europe, we are facing a fresh, new, hot territorial war again. Uh, and we need to um, get back into this mentality of if you want peace, prepare for war. So that, of course, means that we need to relearn deterrence in Europe and um, to effectively deter like increasingly emboldened um, adversaries, not only Russia, but also others. Um, who want to see a weaker West. Um, so obviously the war in Ukraine needs to be won first. And that is uh, the great challenge that we are facing at the moment. A lot depends also on the credibility of the United States extended deterrence far beyond the European theater. So um, I would like to ask you all uh, on this panel now, um, how and what, what should we do? What should be the next step after this strategy of like, supporting Ukraine as long as it takes uh, has proven sort of like unsustainable. If we may start here with you. So first of all, first of all, uh, to say it's exceptionally humbling to be here um, in a session just after Evgenia spoke. So that is the front line of freedom Ukraine is the front line of freedom and um, <laughs> we're nothing by comparison, so just start with that. Um, second, great to be in Poland, um, a place of reality and we desperately need reality and I started visiting this terrific country in the uh, beginning of the 90s, building a new defense relationship between the UK and Poland. So you are an indispensable ally. So main first point, it's time to call time on the sweet little lies, or let's say clearly big fat lies that we've been telling ourselves for years and to get real. The West has absolutely no strategy to win in Ukraine and where looking around are the leaders that we need. So focusing on Ukraine, but I'd say the same applies with China, which is absolutely watching and winning in this century means winning in Ukraine. So we have to do a lot more to defend ourselves and a lot more to support Ukraine and both America and Europe have fallen well short on both counts. And given that we are, we in Europe are next on the menu for Putin, supporting Ukraine is the first priority. We can't just raise the drawbridge on the NATO fortress and leave Ukraine to fail. If we do that, we will fail. And we've been failing Ukraine since 2008 when we falsely promised it could join NATO. In practice, our real focus has been on avoiding war 
on doing enough to quiet our dormant consciences, on limiting our costs, and on reassuring our adversaries and our publics. We've been especially good at saying what we won't do. So in February, it took precisely 24 hours for a whole set of Western leaders to rush to rule out Western troops in Ukraine when President Macron raised that possibility, a terrific example of self-deterrence in action. Part of the problem is that since the Vietnam War, we fought no war which involves serious casualties. So that's 50 years of more or less no war. The war in Ukraine, by contrast, has been killing more or less as many soldiers in a week as died in Afghanistan in 20 years. A major democratic European country the size of France is being dismembered. So imagine if this was France or Germany or Britain. How would we then be looking at it? And this has become remarkably untroubling for European and American voters because our leaders have in most cases not addressed the question of what is at stake and what must be done. And so they fail to explain to our publics clearly, repeatedly and convincingly what's at stake. We've left Ukraine in no man's land and as a result we are in no man's land ourselves. Let's be totally clear, winning in Ukraine means saying clearly to Russia, get all of your troops out of all of Ukraine, and that we will do whatever it takes to get that done. We need to give, um, misquoting a quote, we need to give war a chance and take the Western handbrake off. The as long as it takes approach to the Ukraine war needs to be replaced by whatever it takes. And what would that mean? Uh, briefly, accelerating the provision of systems and munitions provided by Western countries to Ukraine. Doing much more to help Ukraine with air defense, if, including, if necessary, doing it ourselves. Allowing Ukraine much freer use of long-range offensive systems, including in Russia. It's totally unacceptable for Russia to be able to... Um, launch attacks on Ukraine from Russia with impunity. Deploying Western troops to Ukraine. NATO membership for Ukraine as soon as possible and truly wartime uh, levels of defense production. So getting back to being the arsenal of democracy. Last and key point. In order to win, we have to engage our whole societies. We've not done that. We have to explain to our publics clearly and repeatedly what is at stake, why we have to win, what winning means, and then act accordingly. Thank you so much. That was very comprehensive. So more whatever it takes and less as long as it takes. So, Corey, what do you have to add? So um, there's not much to add after uh, that expanse, but I would say what our adversaries have succeeded at is... Um, identifying very clearly what the limits of our actual willingness to do anything are. The gap between how our leaders talk about our willingness and their actual willingness to run risks on behalf of achieving goals is something that has called the credibility of Western commitment into doubt. And, and that's incredibly damaging. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing um, that we ought to be doing is being a lot more empathetic to the fact that our strategy of doing, you know, helping Ukraine for as long as it takes, Ukraine's bleeding and dying in ways we're not empathizing with by saying, just keep doing this forever. Um, and uh, that's both morally wrong, but it also, our strategy assumes that time is unlimited and that Ukraine will never crack under the daily pressure of blackouts and attacks and casualties. Um, and I think uh, that's a very dangerous in addition to immoral thing for us to be standing on. Absolutely. Julian, more do's and don'ts from you. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Uh, and great to see some great old friends. Um, 
I'm going to disagree. And I'm going to disagree because I've built a career on spouting hot air about what we should do. And I am really tired of sitting on panels like this and saying, we should do this and we should do that, and then nothing happening. The real question for this community, and I put it out to the audience, is how on earth do we get our political leaders to face up to the reality which Corey and Patrick have so eloquently described and our friend from Russia so brilliantly captured in terms of the threat. How do we end the culture we have in Europe in particular of holding conferences on security policy which have absolutely no political traction whatsoever? It's getting dangerous out there. When many years ago, when I was at Oxford, I wrote my thesis on British policy in the coming of war. Now, this country in particular suffered at the hands of appeasement. But you know, at the same time as appeasement was taking place, the British government in 1934 committed to the biggest rearmament program in British history. Shadow factory plan, the surge industrial capacity, which meant that by 1940, we had the world's most advanced air defense system which prevailed in the Battle of Britain, which meant that by June 1942, the Nazis could put 500 medium bombers over Britain. We put 1,000 heavy bombers over Cologne. They didn't come out of thin air. They came out of decision-making, leadership, and planning. And there is a black hole in the defense of the West, and it's not in this country. That black hole is Britain, France, and Germany. Those three countries have to start showing leadership. Otherwise, we are going to continue to have these wonderful conferences, these great events, when we talk about what should be done. We should be talking about what is being done and what has been done. And I'm at a loss, and I'll welcome ideas, how we get our leaders to properly grip the reality that is staring us like an angry Russian bear in the face. Thank you. That, that stings. We all love our conferences, after all. <laughs> so, over to you. Always a tough act to follow, Julian. Um, I have what may be an eccentric view about strategy, which is that, at least in its conception, uh, I think it need not be diabolically difficult. Um, and one hears an awful lot of uh, a discussion uh, about a theory of winning in Ukraine. What does winning mean? What does victory look like? It seems to me that, that that's a, a relatively simple question. What it means is, as, as Patrick told us a few moments ago, it means the ejection of the Russian military from Ukrainian national territory. Full stop. That's what winning looks like, that's what winning sounds like, that's what winning is. How to achieve that? Well, it's to, it's to aid Ukraine in marshalling in all of the relevant domains, air, sea, land, space, and cyber, uh, along with all of the impedimenta that goes with that and into defense industrial base and so on, uh, to overwhelm and, and, uh, and dominate the Russian forces in the field. And the wonderful opportunity presented here amidst all this tragedy is that there, there is, in fact, a real opportunity to achieve that, and, and probably even without introducing NATO troops onto the ground. Uh, I, I would also caution against saying the West, because actually there are uh, quite different perspectives within our transatlantic community. And it, I'm not surprising anyone when I point out that the closer you are to the Russian border, I, I would say the more serious you take the threat. Uh, in a previous White House tour, I was, I was always surprised that how the closer you got to Russia, the more tanks you seemed to find. <laughs> and the farther away you got from Russia, the fewer tanks you found, okay? So there is an eastern flank, which really today stretches from Helsinki all the way down to the Black Sea, which understands the reality of what's going on and takes it in a deadly serious way. So this is the Nordics, the Balts, uh, Poland, Romania, for sure. 
But then as you get into Central Europe and Western Europe and certainly in the United States, this becomes much more of an academic exercise. And as Corey pointed out, what seems to be missing from all of the political analysis is the actual human cost on the ground, which is the greatest tragedy in Europe since 1945. And, and, and on a scale which is becoming really difficult to grasp on all sides. It's, it's as much a tragedy that hundreds of thousands of, of Russians have been killed uh, as Ukrainians and wounded uh, and, and all of that. So it, it's certainly doable. The transatlantic community possesses the wherewithal and the resources to aid Ukraine in achieving success on the battlefield, no question. Now Julian raises the really important point, which is where do we find the political will to do that? We may find the political will to do that when we find it on our own doorstep, and that will happen, can only happen if this opportunity has, has been missed. And that would be a tragedy in itself as well. Indeed. Corey, to get, come back to you. Um, there is a lot of talk about like a new Cold War and that we might have to like get back to the, the Cold War thinking and use the vocabulary and, and you know, reestablish deterrence, maybe rollback and, and containment and all that. Do you think that like with your experience, um, is this useful or might it lead us to miss some crucial elements that are new and unique to this very fragile moment that we are in? I do think the framework of the Cold War is a useful way to think about the challenges that we are facing because we are looking at adversaries who feel ideologically threatened by the vitality and dynamism of freedom. And they are looking to impose on their neighbors um, the inability to choose their own paths forward, right? To choose their alliances, to choose the nature of their economy, to choose um, accountability instead of corruption. So, so I do think that we have had the luxury of being reckless about our own security because we have not had major challenges to it. And now we have major challenges to it in the nature of Russian aggression, in the nature of Chinese aggression, in the increasing collusion between China, Russia, um, Iran, and North Korea as we see the rat lines of weaponry that Russia is using in Ukraine. So in the Eisenhower administration, American defense spending was 13% of gross domestic product at a much lower level of prosperity for our country. And I think thinking about the Cold War both in ideological terms and in what it required of us to keep our societies free and vibrant is a useful frame of reference for thinking about this moment. It doesn't capture everything but it does capture the nature of our adversaries, the threats they are posing to us, and calls on us to be more committed than we have been. Indeed. I think we have forgotten that freedom is now for free. Um, Patrick, from your point of view, you've been uh, Assistant Secretary General you know, in, in different positions for, for a long time and until very recently. So you saw sort of like this transformation of NATO um, firsthand. But what's your take as of now? Like, are we sort of like, do we still know in the alliance how to win potentially a territorial war after this eternal peace that lasted 30 years? So thank you. Um, very much for the question, and uh, thank you for giving me some notice of the question. So you might have gathered from my first remarks that I'm fairly pessimistic, um, but I am not um, without hope, and I'm inspired um, by Julian. Um, so, however, we're only now starting to come out of a 30-year break on defense. Um, we had plenty of warning, at least 15 years of warning since, uh, since Georgia, and mostly we've not made very good use of that warning. 
There is, um, I acknowledge, um, not least having been um, involved in the work until a couple of years ago, some good work underway at NATO and amongst allies, raising defense spending, executable defense plans, more ready forces, um, strengthened defensive and offensive capabilities, boosting defense production support to Ukraine. But as I already said, um, it's late in the day and we're not going far or fast enough on any of these files, not remotely so. And that um, includes, as Julian said, um, uh, the US, Germany, France not going fast enough, and I'm afraid I would include um, the US. Uh, the US's current budget projections for defense show um, flatlining or worse um, defense spending. Let's hope uh, that changes. Um, Eastern allies like, uh, like Poland and led by Poland, um, Nordic allies uh, have um, woken up hats off to you. Um, you know uh, the price of weakness better um, than anybody else. I quote uh, on the downside the recent UK announcement that it plans to reach 2.5% of GDP spent on defence by 2030 as a case in point. It was a hollow electioneering uh, gesture um, in large part and it's not remotely serious. President Macron talked um, some time ago about the need for having a, a wartime um, economy, uh, but no ally, I contend, has moved to a wartime economy, despite the fact um, that our enemies, and let's be clear, uh, they are enemies, not competitors, not you know, all the other kind words we have used over the years. Uh, they have moved to wartime economies. Their, uh, their economies uh, reflect that they are at war. Very few of our leaders are telling our publics uh, what is at stake either with Russia or China. So um, in the US where I live now, um, uh, all of us are funding the Chinese war machine every day when we go to the shops. Uh, and are we thinking about that? We, we are buying China's nuclear weapons. Um, our leaders don't want to disturb the long sleep of uh, peace. And after the pandemic, um, inflation certainly in the US is uh, the new public enemy number one, if only that were actually um, true. Given how we are treating Ukraine, we have treated U Ukraine, I would not be feeling overwhelmingly reassured if I were a citizen in this part of Europe. Uh, in living in a country, whatever the country is, that might be next on Putin's dinner menu. And I would not be um, overwhelmingly deterred um, if I was Putin, because um, this war has brutally exposed our limitations, our hesitations, and our fundamental unwillingness um, to pay a serious price for freedom and security. Um, so if the limit of our ambition uh, in Ukraine in Europe over the next several years is maintaining at best a bloody equilibrium um, where uh, let's remember all the blood on the western side uh, if there's a better word for the west happy to use it is reassuringly Ukrainian that's a recipe for failure and we will thoroughly deserve to fail so we have to say now enough is enough and really mean it and I agree that starts in the UK in Germany, in France. And that means taking the steps um, for Ukraine I mentioned earlier. That means taking much more seriously the work underway by allies on much greater numbers of more ready forces, much more ready forces on executable defense plans, on stockpiles, on rebuilding logistic capabilities and on defense production. And last, um, you can't get away from spending. Uh, people hope to do that. For many allies, it's clear already that 2.5%, um, 3% or more of GDP will be necessary to do what they need to do. And I can imagine former President Trump, uh, if he wins a second term, telling allies that spending 3%, 4% on defense is needed. And he would be right. Uh, he was giving allies that message well before the full-scale Russian invasion, and that is even truer now. So it's time to come out of our long uh, post-Cold War sleep to fight and win in Ukraine, to rebuild 
our defences, and to do that, we need, desperately need our leaders to lead, and we need to fully engage our societies. So there is a lot to, lot to be done, and we need to do it now. Thank you very much. In some uh, more positive news, in Finland we actually have activated sort of uh, war economy light, you could say, or this preparatory stage where the defense forces are increasing their cooperation with private companies and so on. So, so there's some, some good things going on uh, in the Nordic region at least. And on the spending, of course, it's also important that it's spent on relevant things and not only pensions, for example. Uh, so, Rich, if we get back to you, um, you already outlined um, what uh, Ukrainian victory would look like, but how about the Russian defeat? Like, if we define Ukrainian victory like this, is it just like the other side of the same coin? And would this be a sufficient, if we talk about the strategic defeat for Russia, would this be sufficient? Well, well first of all, um, uh, again, I don't think in its essentials, uh, this is a particularly difficult question. We're asking Ukraine to attempt to fight a modern high-intensity war, essentially without air power and essentially without long-range fires. So no major European state would ever try to go to war under those handicaps. And we're doing this as a conscious policy decision. So a couple of vignettes for you. In, in the case of, of the United States, we have about 2,000 M1 series tanks that are just sitting in storage out in Sierra in the California desert. And we've gifted the Ukrainians 31 to date. The Ukrainians are trying to fight under serious handicaps when it comes to air defense. The best high altitude system in the world is probably the Patriot system. I, I believe we've given them a single battery of Patriot. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. Um, this is a war which is fascinating in a couple of ways. And one is that the combination of old traditional ways of fighting and very cutting edge, high technology, advanced ways of fighting are combined on the same battlefield. So for example, the importance of artillery, uh, a community which was allowed to dramatically atrophy in the West after the end of the Cold War has been brought back in full force to us. Artillery really does remain the king of the battlefield. But it's also become a battlefield that's dominated by drone warfare. And to contend with uh, high numbers of drones on the battlefield, the Ukrainians lose about 10,000 drones a month. That's a staggering number. They just replace them. Then you have to have not only advanced technology in the form of electronic warfare, but you have to have highly skilled operators. Most Western armies, the United States Army in particular, has no electronic warfare in its brigade and divisions. It has no air defense in its brigades and divisions. Now almost three years into this conflict. So there's a lot of catching up to be done. Um, and if you ask me what does Ukraine need to realize this vision or definition of victory, it needs air power, it needs long range fires, it needs air defense, and it needs them at scale. Why are we not providing that? Again, I, I said a moment ago, this was a conscious policy decision. I think it's probably because we fear the consequences of a Russian defeat. We've given Ukraine what we think is enough not to lose, but we refuse to give Ukraine what is actually required to prevail, to win. And the reason I suspect is because we fear uh, the collapse of Russian society, Putin's ouster, the possible use of nuclear weapons, all these components which come together to describe really the essence of self-deterrence. If you want to play on this chessboard, then you've got to have some resolution, some political will, you, the willingness to take some calculated risks, not to be reckless, but to take some calculated risks, and you have to demonstrate to the adversary, the opponent, the enemy, if I may use the word, that you are as willing to fight as the adversary is willing to fight. And at the end of the day, this is where the credibility of deterrence comes from. Putin, whatever else his failings and his sins may be, is not afraid to fight. And arguably, we are. And that may be, in large measure, why we find ourselves where we are today. Bleak, to say the least. Um, Julian, 
Um, the war in Ukraine obviously has entailed so many very painful lessons on very many levels. Um, given that you also a couple of years ago published a book on uh, the future of warfare, or future warfare and the defense of Europe, what are your two to three like key takeaways uh, if you look at Europe? Thank you. Well, the, the book is still out there. It's still brilliant. And it's still very reasonably priced. Um, <laughs> um, what am I? One of the takeaways I was uh, are, are thus. One is. The United States can only guarantee the security of Europe if Europeans do far more for their own security. The United States is a global power facing global autocracies that are trying to complicate the life of the United States um, and doing it at a time and place of their choosing. Europeans and, and the Allied Reaction Force that will shortly become operational is a good first step. Uh, Europeans must assume that they must be the high-end first responders in an emergency. That's it. That should be the ambition militarily. Second, the Chinese and the Russians are systematically exploring our vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, government is keeping from our peoples the daily cyber attacks, the daily information attacks, the daily hybrid war attacks that are taking place on our countries. Why? because they're treating the citizen as a child. We need to bring the citizens in as partners in resilience. Resilience is the flip side of, of power projection. If we, if we can't secure the home base, we cannot project the power that 21st century defense will require. There's one thing, you know, don't get me wrong when I say this. I have huge respect for the sacrifice of ordinary Russians during World War II. But this narrative that the Moscow regime puts out, that because so many Russians were killed, they won World War II, was because primarily, not just because of Nazi brutality, but of Soviet incompetence. So many Russians died because the Russians put flesh before steel. Now, at the Arcadia Conference in December 19, January 1942, the first time the Americans and the British really sat down to say, how are we, the Western allies, going to fight this war? They came up with a conscious plan called Steel Before Flesh. So, for example, a Lancaster bomber had a crew of seven. But for every Lancaster bomber, there was 35 support elements to put that highly advanced piece of technology over target. And... The, the, the Western Allies might have lost far fewer people, but they, fought, they lost far fewer people because they fought with technology. And that's our strength. We have to have, as part of our deterrence, a technology before flesh strategy which counters this Russian pretense that mass and maneuver is going to always win because they don't care how many die. We have to demonstrate that if they really want to try that, our technology will always prevail. But to do it, to quote the Nike commercial, just do it. You know, I, to finish off this point, looking at the current regional plans of SACU, um, to an extent, classified and all that, um, it's not about 2%, 2.5%, 3%. It's about capability shortfalls. We must, having agreed to these plans, to the NATO military strategy, we have to deliver on the very capabilities in sufficient capacity that we have signed up to. Because if not, well, then I can tell you this. The signal we're sending to the Russians is, well, Donbass, Crimea, not really a critical interest for the West. Yes, we'd rather you didn't do it, but at the end of the day, we know you're going to get it. Maybe Ukraine is a critical interest to in the survival of the rest of Ukraine. That is the message we're sending the enemy with this kind of strategic indifference if we continue not even to fulfill our own plans. Yes, indeed, the spending should not remain in the Excel sheet, right?
All right. Um, I'm so thrilled that we are so well on time. So uh, we have now some time left for questions from the audience. So if I can see some hands. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of hands. Let's start there in the back. And of course, remember to introduce yourselves uh, when, you, when you take the mic. Thanks very much indeed. Benjamin Tallis, German Council on Foreign Relations. What a, what a great panel. Thank you for your comments so far. Let me agree with a couple of you and then put something to you. So, Patrick, you're right. We need a whole of society approach. Rich, you're right. We're not stepping up. Julian, you're right. How do we get from should to did is the absolute question we have to answer. And Corey, I think you're right that part of that equation is convincing our societies of what they stand to lose if we don't. But it is only part of the equation. To actually get our societies on board, to commit to the defense spending we need, to commit to actually stepping up and paying those costs, we have to offer them a credible vision of the future that they actually buy into. And that's the part we're not addressing in these conferences. This has to be whole of society in the true meaning of the word. So that means addressing our societal divisions. It means addressing income inequality. It means addressing the reasons why too many of our people don't believe we deserve to win and thus are unwilling to fight. So I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on how we actually engage those societal dimensions of the art of winning. Thank you. So can I take that one? Absolutely. Because I actually disagree, my friend. And I think it's an example of our tendency to say we have to fix every problem in our society in order to deal with the threats facing us. And I think that overcomplicates the challenge. What I notice when I'm talking to rotary clubs and members of Congress and town hall meetings is that um, the a way to frame it that people can understand, we're actually really good at the balmy, beautiful, peaceful, f prosperous future stuff. What we're not doing well enough is explaining that unless we make the rules, our enemies are going to make the rules, and our societies will cease to be safe and cease to be prosperous. And we have, I mean, we just got fabulous examples this morning about what a Russian rules-based international order would look like, dictating the terms of everybody else's relationships, economies, and freedom. I think that's the message that mobilizes public support, not we have to stop income inequality in the United States because of the rise of China and Russia's aggression. I just don't, I think that will talk us into doing nothing. Go ahead, Julian. Yes, I, I agree with Corey. I mean, it, you know, we can't tick off every other box before we get to defense because defense is the first duty of the state. Uh, to its citizens, and then only then can you start to deal with the inequalities of which you eloquently describe. Um, I want us to stop being analysts and start becoming a movement. I want us, all of us, this community, to start becoming lobbyists. I want us to get into our politicians. You know, I was at Oxford with quite a few of Britain's contemporary leadership. Patrick, I think you would have, you know quite a few. Some of them are quite good. Some of them I wouldn't trust with a Morris bloody minor, I tell you. I mean, you know, it's the nature of politicians these days. Um, because they didn't grow up in this stuff. And they have no idea of history. So we as a group now have to stop comforting ourselves by having nice conferences and start becoming activists. We have to start explaining to these politicians much more coherently and much more aggressively why this disaster could happen on your watch, and you may well be remembered for this disaster. Yeah, I'd also like to add that um, uh, I, I think we do a poor job of articulating to our publics that the cost of this very important venture is eminently bearable. The United States is spending about 5 percent of its defense budget directly and indirectly on assistance to Ukraine. 90% of which stays in the United States benefiting American workers. I would diverge a little bit from Patrick by pointing out that 
Right now, today, the European allies alone spend about $380 billion a year on defense. Even on a war footing, Russia spends about $125 billion. So the resources are there. The money is there. We have some outliers that we need to work on. The Italians, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, who are, are still not very close to, to, to reaching 2% of GDP. But overall, collectively, the European allies are at or above 2%. Now, how those resources are, resources are being used, how that money is being spent, that's a fertile field for, for discussion and for analysis, because it doesn't seem so far to have translated into hard military capability. And I would point out the example of our hosts. So with about half the defense budget of Germany or France or the UK, Poland puts vastly more capability into the field, hundreds of tanks that actually run. And program acquisitions that are among the, the leading ones in the world, Patriot, the most advanced version of, of M1, F-35, and on and on and on. So there are some good models out there that can show us how we can translate the defense resources that we already have, which are not overburdening our societies, they're really not, into actual real capability on the ground that can make a difference. Patrick. So very briefly, queuing off that last point, um, the message is be Polish to Britain, mm -hmm. to France, to Germany. Um, indeed, um, you're leading the way. One little fact from uh, the US. If the US spent per person what other developed economies spend on health care, that would free up around $2 trillion a year. So the US wastes $2 trillion on healthcare. The same number of people die of the same diseases at the same age. So um, worth thinking about. There is, there is money there. And uh, indeed, there is money there on def def uh, for defense. Um, the main message is our enemies are on the march we need to be on the march, and the we, the we is all of us, and the main enemy is not <laughs> pandemics, it's not inflation. We've got actual enemies in the old-fashioned uh, sense. Uh, they don't wish us well. They're doing everything within their power to win this century. We need to win this century. Next question. We have so many here. Let's take one from the front here. Michał Baranowski, uh, German Marshal Fund of the United States. Wonderful to see all the friends, uh, all e with violent agreement with each other, and I think around the room uh, as well. So my question is about, given the agreement in this room, your leaders, our leaders, certainly are hearing this. What are your leaders who are not having the right strategy afraid of? Let's put it very bluntly. You understand your countries, you understand your leaders. What are the scenarios? Second question, if I may, Sławek and others pointed out to the importance of leadership of the United States. Okay, we have not talked about the US election just yet. We have wonderful Republican colleagues and uh, colleagues across the political spectrum on the panel and in the room. Can you imagine a flip in terms of the approach of the United States to leading on European uh, and broader security. Thanks. Well, let's take it like everybody may say one thing that, that our leaders are afraid of, and the U.S. colleagues, of course, please address yes, the second for, question. For the first question, I, I think I touched on that a moment ago. In my opinion, um, certainly in America, but I think also in the case of the great powers in Europe, there's a palpable fear of what might follow if Ukraine was successful and Russia was defeated. So you, you read a lot of commentary about the fragmentation of the Russian state. Uh, a follow-on successor regime might be even worse than Putin. Uh, if defeated on the battlefield, Russia might resort to nuclear weapons and so on and so on and so on. So in my opinion, I think that's, uh, th that, that's a limiting factor in, in, in uh, our less than full commitment to aiding Ukraine. Um, the elephant in the room, of course, is the next election in the United States. Um, and I'm worried about that. Um, I, I worry that, that uh, depending upon the outcome of the election, the United States might begin to disengage from the alliance 
and from the transatlantic relationship. Now, the good news is that all of the polling indicates that support in the United States for NATO still remains very high, on the order of some 78 percent by recent polling. So that, that's encouraging. Um, but to the extent that there is fear that the United States might um, withdraw or disengage or lessen its commitment, that certainly introduces cleavages into the alliance in a very unhelpful way in this very dangerous time. Um, let me speak to my own country, which, as you know, um, the Prime Minister yesterday declared his own suicide um, by calling an election, um, which means we're likely to have a Labour government. Uh, I think it's much more likely than not by July the 4th, which is an interesting date in its own right. Um, I, can t I, can, I can bet you this. First of all, the Labour government will focus on health care, on education, on a host of other things, including potholes, which is very big in Britain these days, um, because post-pandemic, we've had to rebuild the economy. In fact, post-banking crash of the late 2000s, we've had to rebuild the economy. And that is part of the problem of certainly Western European economies. We've had crisis after crisis after crisis. And defence is, is seen as a kind of contingency reserve from which to take money to pay for other things. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is the nature of a Labour government will be that it will invest in defence as a trigger for growth. And that's the argument we have to make. Uh, for example, there's 22 ships and submarines being built for the Royal Navy at the moment. Uh, we will continue to build ships and, and submarines for the Royal Navy. Why? Because it creates jobs. And B, because it keeps that lunatic Celtic fringe in Scotland happy. Um, so, given those imperatives, there are ways to sell to politicians who are fairly strategically illiterate why they should support defence because of its impact not just on the, the, the safety of the citizen but also on the prosperity and growth in the economy. And I think that's, that's pretty much the narrative that, that, that will be adopted. Uh, so maybe what I should add to this is a reminder to the friends of my country that the United States is a country so incredibly dynamic that in the middle of a global pandemic, we could create not just one, but three life-saving vaccines. The second thing to remember about the United States is that we are a country so prosperous, we could not only make that life-saving vaccine free to our citizens, but to millions of others. But the third thing to remember about the United States is that we are a country in which a full third of our citizens will refuse to take a free life-saving vaccine. That's actually who we are. And it's good news for you. The risk tolerance of Americans um, is a source of dynamism. It's a source of our willingness to fight for things other than our own safety. Um, but I grant you, it can be a white-knuckled experience to be an ally of the United States. And this is going to be one of those years when that's true. So I'm going to say, first off, um, I've always loved America. It happens that I was named Patrick Henry after the American patriot, um, or you might say traitor if you're British, really who said, uh, give, me, give me liberty or give me death. I always thought that was a good rallying cry. I was slightly tempted um, when Julian mentioned potholes to make some reference to Washington where you go around in clouds of cannabis fumes um, when you're um, going to work um, quite a place. What, do, what are we afraid of? Um, bluntly put, war. Uh, people listen when Putin rattles his nuclear saber. Uh, but that's why we have nuclear deterrence. So the U.S. has won um, many... Uh, France, the UK, um, so we should not be deterred. Uh, and then, should Europe be worried about the outcome of the election? Absolutely, and I'd say uh, Europe needs to worry about either outcome of the election. 
Um, uh, but in any event, forgetting the outcome of the election, and the U.S. is a great country, it will remain one. Um, Europe needs to do more. It needs to do it now. It must do it in its own interest. It can't just play follow the leader. So let's get on with it. Excellent. We don't quite have time for one more question, but I would really like to thank the panel. This was a very insightful discussion, and I think we all agree we need more action and less talk. Thank you so much, Mina, for moderating the panel. If you could come over, please. I just wanted to follow up with a couple of topics that you mentioned during the discussion. It was really interesting to see how much emphasis there, there was on reality. Uh, I remember Patrick Turner saying that West has absolutely no strategy to win in Ukraine, and that we need to do more and we need to do it now. Um, I'm wondering uh, who convinced you the most, because we heard a lot of arguments, uh, agreements and disagreements, and what is the main takeaway from you, from this panel? I think Patrick Turner also said, we need to give war a chance, so that was like a great quote to kick off the conference. Uh, no, but seriously, um, I think that it's really important, like all the points that were made, that we should also not like fall into this trap of defeatism of thinking that this is an undoable like that that we can't do this it is doable uh we just need to need to get to it and and this is i think a very important message here um what the other thing that stood out to me um was this appeal made by uh, julian linde french uh, who said that we need our leaders to lead and we need our societies especially citizens as partners of resilience but how can we achieve this there are models for that uh, the nordic and baltic countries have been really like working on that for a long time um, because the threat has been closer uh, to us. So I think that there is a lot that can be done and a lot of work is also underway. So also here, my glass is at the moment half full. Thank you, Mina, for moderating the discussion and uh, for these insightful remarks. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much.